So we're going to talk about some of these solutions, some of the things we've got to come up with to, uh, to save the planet. Now, I hope you're all comfortable. Are you comfortable? Because according to the last speaker, this is going to take 9.53 billion hours. <laughs> but seriously, this is, this is a fantastic venue, and I'd like to thank Danny and his team, and I think you'd all agree that this is, this is amazing. One, one, one minor issue is if I look like Clint Eastwood staring into the sun, it's not the sun, it's that over there. So I'm not squinting at you, if you'll excuse me for that. But I wanted to come up with a, a quote that sort of fitted this, this context. So here we are at KTH, one of Sweden's largest, most prestigious technical universities. We're in this fantastic hall where there was a research reactor operating not so long ago. We were listening to music about atoms decaying, radioactive decay. I mean, that's amazing. So how on earth do you get a quote to fit all of that? I decided to choose this guy, Mr. Ernest Rutherford. Okay. In 1908, he won a Nobel Prize, so that's Sweden. Check. The Nobel Prize was on radioactive decay, so that's our band. Check. Um, in the quote, he makes uh, fun of social scientists. KTH is a technical university. Check. But what he has to say is this, is that the only possible conclusion the social sciences, social sciences can draw is this. Some do and some don't. And I'd like to pick that up in a minute. <laughs> okay, now the demand for energy as well as food and water is growing. Okay? And this is, this is a challenge that is facing humanity. We need to be able to meet these. But it doesn't just face humanity. All right? It affects our humanity. Something like 1.8 billion people do not have access to electricity. Three billion people cannot afford to heat their homes or cook food with clean fuels. 900 million people suffer from chronic, uh, chronic food shortages because of, because of extreme poverty. 800 million people do not have access to safe water. And something like two billion people suffer from food or water security at some point or another. These are extreme issues. Now, the, the energy, food, and water cycles, if you like, systems are strongly interconnected. They're commodities that are traded on the global market. So an effect in one place can affect the rest of the world. They're strongly interconnected. Changes in demand in one can change demands in the other. They're also connected with the environment and with the climate. These, these, are, these are key things. But also super key is that these three things have been at the heart of conflicts for a very long time. And because we live in a constrained world and demand is growing, unless we do something smart, we're very likely to have a lot more conflicts in the future. Now, many governments and large international organizations like the UN often do planning and they think about policies and they try and figure out how to meet each one of these things in isolation. But when we look at things in isolation, this can have terrible consequences if we don't consider the full system. So uh, this is a picture of some people working in Punjab province in India. Now, the government there is providing farmers in the province with free electricity to try and kickstart development. Okay. Um, this province only takes up something like 1.5% of the land area of the whole of India. Yet this government uh, purchases grain and wheat that's grown here to feed some, more than half of the 400 million Indians that are on this government feeding program. Okay. Now, the problem is that um, they need to pump a lot of water for the irrigation. They pump this water from aquifers. They pump the water faster than the aquifers are replenished. And they use a lot of energy to do this. Uh, but because the electricity that they use is free, they just keep on pumping. The more they pump, the deeper the aquifers go, the more electricity is required. And this particular country has extreme problems with electricity production. Something like 20% of the electricity use in India is simply for pumping water for irrigation purposes. Okay. Now, the Indian government is acutely aware that these are problems and they're interrelated. However, the planning that takes place, the assessment in the background, is, is done in isolation. So what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? How are we going to think about integrated systems and come up with neat, neat solutions? Well, we're going to look for clues, okay? Very important. But not the kind Sherlock here is looking for. What we're looking for are sensible climate, land, energy, water strategies, 
Okay. This is an acronym for a program that's been put together by a bunch of large international organizations, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, the United Nations Division for Social and Economic Affairs, the Food and Agriculture Association, the International Atomic Energy Agency. They'd be very happy to know we're talking about this here, by the way. <laughs> um, the International Renewable Energy Agency, maybe not so happy. But um, uh, a whole bunch of really important large uh, uh, groups, international associations, uh, international Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. But what's really neat is that KTH is uh, acting as a hub for this particular activity. And uh, it is the most inspiring thing to see some of the PhD students we have working on this work in a way where they know that this is going to make a difference. And, it's, and it is. Some of the things we want to answer with uh, this particular project, which looks at developing consistent methodologies to look at uh, food security, water security, and energy security, is um, you know how are we going to meet this? How are we going to how are we going to meet this increasing demand with um, with perhaps a limited supply? What technology systems are going to work to tackle some of the problems that we have here? Maybe individual pieces of technology. We'll talk about one of those in a minute. But maybe systems of technology are really important. So we want to think about those and, and, uh, and put them into a global context. And importantly for policymakers, what are the policies that are going to inspire or incentivize technologists to develop these technologies or the systems of technologies that are important? How are we going to set up po policies that are going to make this profitable into the future so that the right kind of incentives and so on? And we also want to try and simulate what will happen if we just do nothing, if we carry on business as usual. Now, the results of this particular work have been incredibly interesting. Um, I have to remember that like epic win sort of deal because one of, the, one of the case studies we had a look at, this is a small island in the, in the Indian Ocean. We started to have a look at this integrated system and some of the challenges that it was, that it was facing. And what we found is, is that in this particular island, we could use windmills, renewable energy sources, to desalinate water, okay, which is very cheap to store. People who work on this will know that windmills are difficult when it comes to electricity because sometimes you have to store that electricity and that can be expensive. And this is something that people hope to address to some extent with smart grids. So we could produce water. With this extra water, it's possible to increase the production of crops. And these could be crops either for food or for the production of biofuel. Now the biofuel that we did in this particular assessment, which the government of Mauritius is looking at, was ethanol. Ethanol can be used in the transport fleet. It can displace gasoline or petrol. Okay. Now, this island was completely dependent on the import of, of petrol. So very quickly, we could improve the water security of the island, the food security of the island, and um, the energy security of this particular island. Now, because ethanol is based on a crop, and as the crop grows, it takes in carbon, di carbon dioxide and carbon from the atmosphere, uh, it's a carbon-neutral fuel, unlike the, the petrol that was being used in the transport fleet before in our simulations. So we reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are taking place. Those steps are very loud over there. <laughs> because gasoline is based on crude oil, and the crude oil price is relatively high at the moment, what was neat is there were huge savings to be had by doing this, to, by, to, to, to move to ethanol. So the savings were so big that you could, in fact, do this whole thing out of those savings and then have some money left over. So you're going green at a profit. Not only that, in this particular country, seven of the ni last nine years, there have been water shortages because of uh, changes in rainfall, short-term climate uh, or weather changes, which people think are linked to the climate. But because we have a secure supply of water now that's not necessarily dependent on, on rainfall patterns, we also have the potential to produce, produce crops in a way that's independent too. So we help this particular island to think about how to adapt to climate change, something that's, that's particularly important. 
we're over the moon about this particular case study. This case study has been presented in uh, New York at the United Nations Commission for Sustainable Development. Uh, a conference that's coming up uh, that's just been introduced by Angela Merkel is, is going to be presenting this too. And at Rio Plus 20, we've got this, plus other case studies that we're going to be uh, presenting too. They're all exciting. Now, when I was talking to the, the guy, the great guy who... Um, uh, decided to put the funds together to, to, to sponsor this particular project. I remember going to him with all of the arguments. It was like, you know, this is, a, this is a fantastic little island. It's got great data. We have very clear boundaries, as islands often do. Um, the government is, is superb. There's strong institutional, strong institutional structures there. And it's a small island developing state. In the big political economy, this is, this, this is, this is a great deal at the moment. Of course, we were just keen also on a nice extended study trip and perhaps, you know, being based at a hotel on the beach somewhere for a few weeks to gather more data. But uh, we're, still, we're still hoping that that's going to take place. I want to end off with a story that I think is incredibly moving and incredibly powerful. When we think about technology development, and we think about countries and situations, what do we think of? We think of Silicon Valley in California, United States, MIT, we think about the UK, we think about Sweden, fantastic uh, high-tech uh, energy-related industry here, we think about Japan, we think about a bunch of places. And if I look around this room, I think that the resources that are represented here, I mean, for goodness sakes, there was a research reactor right here. And the, 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 the ability that we have to tackle problems, they're huge. This is a picture of uh, Sarah Ferry. Sarah Ferry is working on a remarkable product in Botswana. See, there is something like 160 million poor people who are deaf, who live out in the jungle, in the bush, or in remote areas where they don't have access to, to earphones. Uh, to, to hearing aids. If those hearing aids break, they don't have access to the right kind of skills to fix them. They're often too poor to buy new ones, yeah, because these things just aren't manufactured in those countries. And um, yeah, where are you going to get batteries out in the bush? A reliable supply of batteries for these hearing aids. So what the Botswana Technology Center decided to do is they thought, stuff it. We are going to conceptualize, design, produce, and commercialize a solar-powered hearing aid. Oh, what a smart idea. And they did it, super successfully. Sarah works in a company that's, that's manufacturing these, the only country in Africa that manufactures hearing aids. Now, the international interest in this was so large from developing countries in particular that they're trying to copy it. What the Botswana uh, Technology Center then decided to do is to open source the entire design so that this could be replicated in different parts of the world. Just, just fantastically visionary. But the real kicker about this is um, <coughs> Sarah in this picture over here, she's deaf. So I'd like to end off with a, and, and she would have had none of that unless this little institute decided that it was going to do its thing. So I'd like to end off a, a, and sum up. Number one. The need is clearly urgent and important. Number two, amongst other things, we've got to look for sustainable development clues. Climate, land, energy, and water strategies. Number three, there are some epic wins. <laughs> Think about the Mauritius example we had earlier on. And uh, number four, if you think you can't do it, just remember that picture of Sarah Ferry earlier on. Now, Mr. Rutherford's quote was that there are two different groups of people out there, okay? And as I look around this room, I see super bright technologists, brilliant philanthropists, a, stun a stunning array of potential. So according to Rutherf Rutherford, there are these two groups, people who do and people that don't. I'd like to challenge you. Throw yourself into the first group. Be the people that do. And if you have a smart idea for how to be a better steward of this planet, I dare you to do it. Thank you. <laughs>